aren't the people who identify as LGBTQ plus normal human beings like everyone else? Isn't their behavior completely natural and not a choice? After centuries of oppression, isn't it time they finally get the rights that they deserve? Why would God care about who people love and have a relationship with? Isn't the stance of traditional religions like Islam on LGBTQ plus backwards, intolerant, inhumane, and irrational? Shouldn't Islam reform its position on this matter to become more tolerant and accepting? These are just some of the doubts and questions that are raised when it comes to LGBTQ plus and Islam, and we aim to respond to them in this video. بسم الله الحمد لله الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن ولا. LGBTQ plus is a movement that has gained wide acceptability in Western society in the past few decades, and the Eastern part of the world isn't far behind. The LGBTQ plus rights movement, also known as the gay rights or homosexual rights movement, advocates for the normalization and rights of gay men lesbians, transgender people, and others. And it also seeks to eliminate stigma and laws against these identities and their behavior. Using the tools of media, politics, laws, and even education, much of which target the youth and children, LGBTQ activists have successfully incorporated themselves into mainstream Western society. The very same methodology is being introduced into Muslim countries and other non-Western nations to normalize LGBTQ people and behavior. In this video, we'll be looking at some of the standard arguments given by LGBTQ activists, the Islamic stance on LGBTQ in general, its effects and consequences on human society, the nature of categorizing human beings by their supposed sexual orientation, some of the Muslim confusion on this issue, and what stance on this matter is actually rational and beneficial for human beings. The focus here will be on the homosexuality side of the spectrum. We will leave transgenderism and gender fluidity for another video. Let's start by taking a look at some of the common arguments brought up by pro-LGBT activists. me that I can be anything and what I am is I'm gay I know really I've known since you were three all you wanted for your birthday was a pair of sensible heels I guess I'm not totally in love with the idea, but if that's who you are, there's nothing I can do about it. And I love you just as much. World, lesbians, gay men, and bisexual and transgender people are denigrated, attacked, imprisoned, tortured, even killed because of who they are or whom they love. We can call this that we were born this way or it's who we are argument. In fact, this argument is so popular, there's even a famous pop song written about it. There is no conclusive evidence that homosexual feelings or behavior are purely natural, even though there have been many attempts to prove this. All evidence points to the fact that it is an amalgamation of environmental factors that lead to this feeling and behavior. A new study found there is no single gene that can determine a person's sexual orientation. The Science Journal published what is being considered the largest genetic study on sexual behavior. The research concluded that a person's sexual orientation is shaped by a mix of genetics and environmental factors, as opposed to having a single gay gene. The study took into account the genetic profiles of nearly 500,000 people from the U.S. and U.K. That group is about 100 times larger than other similar studies. There are even well-known groups within the LGBT movement that openly admit that being different orientations is their choice. For example, the group called Queer by Choice. 
Many LGBTQ activists themselves openly admit that the born this way argument is a very weak argument and it is more useful as a political tool rather than for any actual truthful discourse. We will quote some of them over here. Dr. Lillian Federman, an LGBT historian, writes, And we continue to demand rights, ignoring the fact that human sexuality is fluid and flexible. The concept of gay and lesbian identity may be nothing but a social construct, but it has been crucial, enabling us to become a political movement and demand the rights that are due to us as a minority. What becomes of our political movement if we openly acknowledge that sexuality is flexible and fluid, that gay and lesbian does not signify a people, but rather a sometime behavior? John D'Amelio is a homosexual professor of history and women's and gender studies at the University of Illinois at Chicago. He says, What's most amazing to me about the born gay phenomenon is that the scientific evidence for it is as thin as a reed, yet it doesn't matter. It's an idea with such social utility that one doesn't need much evidence in order to make it attractive and credible. Camille Paglia, a feminist lesbian author and LGBT rights advocate, says in her book, Vamps and Tramps, Homosexuality is not normal. On the contrary, it is a challenge to the norm. Nature exists, whether academics like it or not. And in nature, procreation is the single, relentless rule. That is the norm. Given the intense hormonal surge of puberty, the total absence of adult heterosexual desire is neither normal nor natural. Sexuality is highly fluid, and reversals are theoretically possible. Helping gays learn how to function heterosexually if they so wish is a perfectly worthy aim. Despite the overwhelming evidence that the born gay argument is an extremely weak one, even if we do concede that these feelings and desires are completely natural, we can ask a very basic question. Is it okay to make the same argument for pedophilia, rape, necrophilia, zoophilia, and other fetishes? If we are going to make the case that natural equals moral, then there are a lot of behaviors within the animal kingdom that would be extremely disturbing if practiced by human beings. The morality of homosexuality or any desire or behavior cannot be purely determined based on whether it is natural or not. I travel around the world meeting with governments in many countries. I find not only a lack, a lack of knowledge on the part of government officials, but huge resistance to acknowledging the rights, the human rights of LGBT people. I will, I will say again what I said in 2011. Gay rights are human rights, and human rights are gay rights once and for all. This is another rhetorical argument brought forth by LGBTQ activists. It basically says that people shouldn't be mistreated or treated differently for quote-unquote who they are. In other words, people engaging in homosexual behavior or publicly claiming homosexual desires should be treated the same as everyone else. This is a red herring of an argument meaning that the rhetorical statement distracts from the actual issue at hand. To explain this, let's imagine a simple scenario. Let's say someone in a certain society is a known thief. This thief openly admits he's a thief and he is proud of it. He tries to get a job, but is discriminated against. He tries to get access to healthcare, but is again discriminated against. He attempts to get married, but he is refused and discriminated against. This is because the society he is in views stealing as morally evil and wrong and treats this man based on this belief. When it comes to homosexuality, the problem is exactly the same. The conflict isn't really about rights, rather it is about what is morally acceptable or not. Because the action a homosexual is saying he does or is inclined towards is different and abnormal from what a traditional society would be used to. And that behavior has to be evaluated according to a moral code, which for Muslims comes from Islamic sources like Quran, Sunnah, and the scholarly tradition. Before any discussion can occur about any sort of rights, rights also have to come from a moral paradigm, and restrictions and punishments can be placed upon people not seen as morally correct. For example, 
people can be discriminated against and even arrested in certain countries for believing or preaching genocidal sentiments, for example, the Nazi ideologies, because these would be considered morally reprehensible by these countries. Would it be reasonable to complain about these individuals' rights as well? There are other arguments that LGBTQ activists put forth as well. These include the likes of quote-unquote love is love, an implication that homosexual relationships are like relationships between men and women. And this behavior doesn't affect you. We're not harming anyone. These arguments will automatically be refuted by the upcoming content in this video. The Islamic stance on the issue of homosexuality is an extremely clear, straightforward, and agreed-upon matter. Not only is homosexuality seen as something evil and wrong, but it is also considered one of the most severe sins that a person can fall into, a sin that deserves an extremely harsh penalty because of the consequences it brings forth. We will quote some verses in the Quran about the Prophet Lut salam. His people had fallen into the action of homosexuality. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, and the translation of the meaning of these verses is and we had sent Lut when he said to his people do you commit such immorality as no one has preceded you with from amongst the worlds indeed you approach men with desire instead of women rather you are a transgressing people but the answer of his people was only that they said evict them from their city indeed they are men who keep themselves pure so we saved him and his family except for his wife she was one of those who remained with the evildoers and we rained upon them a rain of stones then see how was the end of the criminals there are many narrations from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam about the issue of homosexuality, and we will mention a couple of them over here. In the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam describes a group of people that have earned the curse of Allah on them. This includes the one who does the deed of the people of Lut, in other words, homosexuality. In another narration mentioned in Sunan Abi Dawood and other sources as well, the Prophet ﷺ prescribes the death penalty for the people who commit the act of homosexuality. He says, if you find anyone doing as Lut's people did, kill the one who does it and the one to whom it is done. Because of the clarity of these verses of the Quran and the Ahadith, the ulama have complete consensus on the evil nature of homosexuality and its status as something that deserves capital punishment. Ibn al-Qayyim mentions that the Sahaba were on the consensus that there is no sin that brings worse consequences than homosexuality and they are second only to the evil consequences of kufr and that the consequences of homosexuality may be worse than that of murder. He also mentions in the same book because the evil consequences of homosexuality are among the worst of evil consequences, so its punishment is one of the most severe punishments in this world and in the hereafter. He also mentions the punishment that was sent to the people of Lut salam, and he says that Allah punished them with a punishment that he did not send upon any other nation. He combined all kinds of punishments for them, such as destruction, turning their houses upside down, causing them to be swallowed up by the earth, sending stones down upon them from the sky, taking away their sight, 
punishing them and making their punishment ongoing and wreaking vengeance upon them such as not wrought upon any other nation. That was because of the greatness of the evil consequences of this crime which the earth can hardly bear if it is committed upon it. And the angels flee to the furthest reaches of the heaven and the earth if they witness it, lest the punishment be sent upon those who do it, and they be stricken along with them. Ibn Taymiyyah has similar statements in his writings, and he says in one of them, with regards to homosexuality, the Sahaba were unanimously agreed that both are to be killed, the active and the passive partners, whether they are married or not. We want to leave a very obvious disclaimer over here that the death penalty is to be implemented by a legitimate Islamic state after a due process, not by random individuals. The Islamic stance about homosexuality might seem extremely harsh to the modern mind that has been conditioned to accept homosexuality as normal or at least tolerable. However, other religions and traditions have very similar sentiments. For example, in the Old Testament, in the book of Leviticus, it says that if a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death, their blood shall be upon them. In the New Testament, similar sentiments are echoed, and as we can see here, it says in Romans, And likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. And a few verses later, it refers to the same people, and it says, Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Aren't these stances intolerant and backwards? Do these religions, and especially Islam, need a reformation to become more accepting towards homosexuality? This is what many people have been pushing for in the media, law, education, etc. There's places such as here where the LGBT community, there's, there's um, prison time, death penalty for that, that and restrictions from, from people from being themselves and I don't believe in that and religions can change, rules can change, rulers can change those things, they have the power to. So we don't choose where we're going, others have chosen for us to be here so we have to make sure that they, we have to put, apply the pressure on them to make sure that they are doing right by the people. We would like to showcase in this next section of the video what the consequences of homosexuality are and why the Islamic stance on this issue is so harsh. There are many clear harmful aspects of the LGBTQ lifestyle, particularly the lifestyle of homosexuality. The first and foremost issue is that a Muslim should realize that any sort of widespread disobedience to Allah brings about major harms to society in general. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Rum, and the translation of the meaning of this verse is Corruption has appeared throughout the land and sea by what the hands of people have earned, so he may let them taste part of the consequence of what they have done, that perhaps they will return to righteousness. The scientific community is well acquainted with the problems that exist within the homosexual community. Physically, the health amongst homosexuals is generally poor because of the many diseases that are prevalent within them. To turn me around. Bobby um, Campbell is fighting for his life, one of a rapidly growing group whose battle has fascinated and frightened modern medicine. He has Kaposi sarcoma, a deadly skin cancer that first appeared on the bottom of his feet as spots the size of a quarter. There is a one in five chance a victim will die within the first year of the illness. It's a disease first detected in the gay community that has now spread beyond that a disease experts are now calling a national epidemic. There are more lives claimed, victims claimed, than, than toxic shock and Legionnaire's disease combined. And yet most of the country doesn't know about this cancer. Legionnaire, Why? Well, I think it's because it's a gay cancer. It appeared a year ago in New York's gay community, then in the gay communities in San Francisco and Los Angeles. 
There are many scientific studies and journals that point to the fact that several types of cancer, diseases, and behaviors that lead to diseases are more common in the LGBTQ community compared to the heterosexual community. Even people part of the LGBTQ community realize that the destructive lifestyle of the community is what leads to these issues. Camille Paglia writes in her book, Vamps and Tramps, AIDS did not appear out of nowhere. It was a direct result of the sexual revolution, whose worst effects were to be suffered primarily by gay men. In the West, despite much propaganda to the contrary, AIDS is a gay disease and will remain one for the foreseeable future. Gabriel Rotello, who is a gay musician and filmmaker, writes, The primary factor that led to increased HIV transmission was anal sex combined with multiple partners, particularly in concentrated core groups. Also important was a general decline in group immunity caused by repeated infections of various STDs repeated inoculations of antibiotics and other drugs to combat them, as well as recreational substantive abuse, stress, and other behaviors that compromised immunity. The issues of health with the homosexual community aren't limited to physical health alone. The community also has a large issue with mental problems and diseases as well. Despite this, LGBT people still suffer with higher levels of depression, anxiety, addictions and suicide. I know because I'm one of them. Soho used to be a place that I would come to to get out of my head. Today, in recovery, I'm more likely to be here sipping a cup of herbal tea. Why is it that so many LGBT people suffer with mental health problems? In my experience, these problems are never far away. Rob Goddard was a man I worked with briefly at Attitude magazine. In 2013, at the age of just 34, he took his own life. According to the National Alliance on Mental Illness, lesbian, gay and bisexual adults are twice as likely as heterosexual adults to experience a mental health condition. Lesbian, gay and bisexual youth are also much more likely to be depressed and suicidal. According to the American Psychiatric Association, LGBTQ individuals are 2.5 times more likely to experience depression, anxiety, and substance misuse compared with heterosexual individuals. According to the Family Research Institute, children in gay families are more likely to be socially disturbed, more likely to abuse substances, less likely to get married, and have a host of other issues. According to the Journal of LGBT Health Research, Domestic violence is much more common within lesbians and gays compared to heterosexual couples. Some LGBT rights activists have also expressed their desire to change or even destroy marriage and the family structure itself. Masha Gessen is a lesbian gay rights activist, well known in the LGBT community. While discussing same-sex marriage, she said, It's a no-brainer that we should have the right to marry, but I also equally think that it's a no-brainer that the institution of marriage should not exist. We lie that the institution of marriage is not going to change, and that is a lie. The institution of marriage is going to change, and it should change. And again, I don't think it should exist. I have three kids who have five parents, more or less, and I don't see why they shouldn't have five parents legally. After my divorce, I met my new partner, and she just had a baby, and that baby's biological father is my brother. And my daughter's biological father is a man who lives in Russia, and my adopted son also considers him his father. So the five parents break down into two groups of three, and really, I would like to live in a legal system that is capable of reflecting that reality, and I don't think that's compatible with the institution of marriage. Unfortunately, the harms of homosexuality don't end at physical diseases, mental issues, drug abuse, and dysfunctional families. One-year-old Stephen Garrard and 26-year-old Timothy Doyle alleged to have abused boys aged between four and seven years old. We will allege in court that both men, aged at just 21 and 26, sexually abused at least eight young children since 2018. Police will allege they traded images of horrendous abuse with others in their secret network. The controversy surrounding Old Dominion University professor Dr. Alan Walker centers around their argument that not everyone who is attracted to children will abuse children. 
it isn't actually a choice. So people are just born with this condition. In an interview with the Prostasia Foundation, Walker said the term minor attracted people or MAPS should be used to describe people who are attracted to children. It's less stigmatizing than other terms like pedophile. Uh, a lot of people, when they hear the term pedophile, they automatically assume that it means a sex offender. Uh, and that isn't true, and it leads to a lot of misconceptions about attractions toward minors. But not everyone sees Richard Kramer, an American lawyer and judge who advocated and carried out some of the earliest same-sex marriages in the United States, writes, we need to confront the stigmatization, demonization, and stereotyping that exists due simply to our attraction to children or adolescents, regardless of our behavior. To do this, we need to be honest about our sexuality. Milton Orkopoulos, an Australian politician honored for being one of the first openly gay politicians in the national parliament, was arrested on child pornography charges and eventually convicted on 54 charges of molesting underage boys and drug-related activity. The victims included boys aged from 10 to 18. Marshall Kirk and Hunter Matson are two authors of a book called After the Ball, where they discuss how LGBT should be normalized in the United States. In this book, they write, In time, we see no reason why more and more diversity should not be introduced into the projected image, that is to say, drag queens, pedophiles, etc. According to a review by Regents University regarding child molestation, the International Lesbian and Gay Association, once recognized by the United Nations as an official non-governmental organization or NGO for representing the homosexual community worldwide, had passed several resolutions to abolish age of consent laws and they claimed same-sex age of consent laws often operate to oppress and not to protect and that they as an organization supported the right of every individual regardless of age to explore and develop her or his sexuality. Kate Millett, a well-known lesbian feminist, said in an interview, one of children's essential rights is to express themselves sexually, probably primarily with each other but with adults as well. So the sexual freedom of children is an important part of a sexual revolution. Mark J. Newton and Peter Trong were two LGBT activists who had adopted a boy from Russia. They then proceeded to sexually abuse this boy from the age of two weeks old and use the child to make pornographic videos, taking him to three countries to be molested by many other homosexual pedophiles. Before this was exposed by the authorities, Newton and Trong were featured in several TV programs and magazine articles to showcase an ideal gay family. Walter Lee Williams is a former American professor of anthropology, history, and gender studies at the University of Southern California. He is considered one of the pioneers in the field of queer studies, and he was considered one of the most eminent members of the LGBT community inside California. In 2013, he was arrested, convicted, and imprisoned for possessing child pornography and conducting sexual acts with multiple underage boys. These are not unique one-off events and statements. Rather, several studies show that members of the homosexual community are much more likely to be pedophiles than the heterosexual community. In a study called The Proportion of Heterosexual and Homosexual Pedophiles Among Sex Offenders Against Children, the authors write, Using phallometric test sensitivities to calculate the proportion of true pedophiles among various groups of sex offenders against children, and taking into consideration previously reported mean numbers of victims per offender group, the ratio of heterosexual to homosexual pedophiles was calculated to be approximately 11 to 1. This suggests that the resulting proportion of true pedophiles among persons with a homosexual erotic development is greater than that in persons who develop heterosexually. To summarize, homosexual behavior in a society leads to more physical diseases, higher rate of mental health issues, increased substance abuse, and a prominence of pedophilia. After looking at all these evidences and proofs for the severe harm that homosexual behavior brings upon society, any rational mind should be able to understand why the Islamic stance on homosexuality is so harsh. We would like to comment on the categorization of human beings into sexual orientations. Is this something that actually makes sense? 
The concept of lesbian and gay identities is a fairly recent phenomenon, and this is commented on by several academics. In their book Sex Wars, Lisa Duggan and Nan Hunter write, Lesbian and gay historians have asked questions about the origin of gay liberation and lesbian feminism, and have come up with some surprising answers. Rather than finding a silent, oppressed gay minority in all times and all places, historians have discovered that gay identity is a recent Western historical construction. They also describe how this identity has laid the basis for organized political activity in the years following World War II. They say, the work of lesbian and gay historians has also demonstrated that human sexuality is not a natural timeless given, but is historically shaped and politically regulated. Charlotte Patterson, a professor of psychology, writes in the Developmental Psychology Journal, the contemporary notion of sexual identity is itself historically created. The concept of a specifically homosexual identity seems to have emerged at the end of the 19th century. Indeed, only in relatively recent years have large number of individuals identified themselves openly as gay or lesbian or bisexual. Gay, lesbian, and bisexual public identities, then, are a phenomenon of our current historical era. Under the Islamic paradigm, the main categorization of people is based on their beliefs. Desires and inclinations are not a way to categorize people in Islam. For example, can we categorize people into a group for preferring certain types of food over another, or wearing certain colors of clothing over another? Would it make sense to ask for special rights and laws based on these inclinations? What if someone had a harmful behavior, like eating a lot of desserts despite having diabetes? Should they be given a special identity, rights, and protection based on this special categorization? In any traditional society, people will be asked, encouraged, and possibly forced to control their destructive desires so that they don't harm themselves and the people around them. The LGBTQ movement has blurred the lines between desires and behaviors with the concept of sexual identities. Destructive desires, no matter what they are, aren't sinful on their own, but they should be controlled and kept under check so that they do not lead to the destructive behavior. People who have homosexual desires are not sinful for these inclinations. Rather, they are obliged to control these desires and understand that they should not identify with them and seek help to deal with them. The good news is that reversal and elimination of these desires is completely possible, as admitted to by LGBTQ activists themselves. And there are also several testimonies from religious community leaders that showcase this reality. Brother that I know personally that was a practicing homosexual, uh, and he was not Muslim, and he read about Islam and he agreed with the the aqidah of Islam, and alhamdulillah he took the shahada, and then he came and talked to me. This was many, many years ago. And he's not in San Diego anymore, in case any of the San Diego brothers are watching. We don't want you to try to guess at this. Um, but, and he kept it in confidence. And he spoke to me and he said, look, you know, I was involved in this lifestyle. I realized it's wrong, but this is where my attraction is. And we spoke and we realized that he was, there was a time when he was attracted to females. And then he went through a certain uh, experience with a particular female and uh, he got involved in drugs and then he got involved in that lifestyle and, and it messed up your fitra. Just like if somebody is attracted to uh, an animal, like some people want, I mean, somebody's fitra is messed up, somebody's uh, got some other uh, issue that they're dealing with. So then we gave them counseling, we sat and talked to them until alhamdulillah, after years, after years, he came but more balanced he decided that he was going to get married and he approached a sister and he in confidence told her everything and alhamdulillah they got married and today they're married and they have children and you know I, I i'm sure he still struggles with it but alhamdulillah i've spoken to him and he's living a happy life Many Muslims around the world are being pressured to accept LGBT in general and homosexuality in specific as normal or at least something that they shouldn't oppose. Some Muslims crumble to this pressure while others happily take up the LGBT rights cause and openly support it. You know, Qatar is like any other society in this world. 
Qatar is not different than any other society in this world. It is a society where homosexuality isn't allowed. It is a, um, a hospitable and it is a very um, tolerant society. I, I disagree with you, Amanda. But open homosexuality is not allowed, is it? So if a homosexual couple married in the UK or in the United States was to come here to Qatar, then what? They can come here to Qatar. And be 100% safe and free to act as a married couple? They will be coming to Qatar as fans of a football tournament. They can do whatever any other human being would do. Muslim civil rights, but you also campaign against homophobia and in favor of LGBT rights. Do you see that as all part of the same struggle? Absolutely, and I will say this about American Muslims, there has not been any coordinated, coordinated campaign oppositional to the Supreme Court um, decision for same-sex marriage. This is a civil rights issue. We have no place as American Muslims targeted in the United States of America to oppose another marginalized group in this country, which includes LGBTQ communities. I think what the conversation around same-sex marriage uh, opens in the Muslim community that we don't have, we don't even have this conversation, is that we do have people in our community. We can't be like Ahmed Dijanad and say we don't have gay Muslims. We do have. How do we integrate them into a conversation? How do we create the spaces to bring them closer to Islam, for example? We need to make sure that everyone's included. Well, let me put that point. First and foremost, we would like to remind Muslims the fate of the wife of Lut alayhi salam because of her support of homosexuality. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, ضرب الله مثلا للذين كفروا امرأة نوح وامرأة لوط كانتا تحت عبدين من عبادنا صالحين فخانتاهما فخانتاهما فلم يغنيا عنهما من الله شيئا وقيل دخل النار مع الداخلين And the translation of the meaning of this verse is Allah presents an example of those who disbelieved the wife of Nuh and the wife of Lut. They were under two of our righteous servants, but they betrayed them. So they did not avail them from Allah at all. And it was said to them, Enter the hellfire with those who enter. Ibn Kathir reports in his tafsir that Ibn Abbas, one of the cousins and companions of the Prophet wasallam, is said to have narrated about this verse. As for the wife of Prophet Lut, she used to inform the people of the city who committed the awful sexual act, that is to say homosexuality, whenever a guest was entertained by her husband. In other words, she enabled the homosexual behavior of the people of Lut salam, which is exactly what the Muslims who are supporting LGBT rights like same-sex marriage are doing as well. We should realize that by supporting LGBT rights and enabling homosexual behavior, not only are we wishing and encouraging the curse of Allah upon these people that we supposedly support, we are also indirectly responsible for the destructive behaviors and consequences caused by homosexuality, as described in the previous part of this video. As Muslims, we should be the source of guidance for people, bringing others towards the worship of Allah by enjoining good and forbidding evil as per the instructions of the Quran, instead of enjoining evil and pushing non-Muslims and ourselves further into our own destruction. Islam, being the religion of our Creator who knows us better than we know ourselves, provides a coherent and clear way to deal with all sorts of issues in society. An Islamic system of life places emphasis on stable families and controlling destructive desires that can lead to the breakdown of families in society. Islam has severe punishments for crimes that have severe consequences, and this is something that we as Muslims should not shy away from. It is not Islam that needs reform to accept LGBTQ rights, rather it is Western society and all other societies that need to reform to accept Islam utterly and completely for their own sake. Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdika, ashadu an la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in.
بغير النور في الليل هدى لن ننطفي أبدا لن ننتهي أبدا وإنك برق في السماء جاء ملتهبا